ahead and get started. <coughs> so, welcome everybody to uh, EE240. My name is a lot a lot. I'll be your instructor for this semester. Uh, for those of you guys who are here in person, you'll be sort of obvious, and actually, if you're watching it afterwards, it'll be also obvious. Uh, the class is videotaped and will be up on the web. I'll go through sort of the logistics of you know where you can find the videos and all that. Uh, but that does mean that you know if you're here in person, when you ask a question, it will you know show up on the audio. Uh, your face won't be there, so you can still be somewhat anonymous. So you know don't worry about that. Um, I will be making this sort of fairly interactive, so don't let that intimidate you. You know just pretend nothing's happening, and you know it'll all work out just fine. So before we sort of dive into kind of logistical details and things like that, just First things first, obviously, what is this class all about? Well, as I'm sure you guys know, this class is all about analog. But more importantly, this class is really about analog design. Okay, So that's a little bit different than what you may have done in some of your previous courses. An example, let's say 140 or 105 or one of those, where a lot of the focus was actually on sort of analysis and understanding how things operate. That's still going to be obviously critical for everything we do here. But really, the point of this class is to do design. Okay. So typically, the way that happens is there's some sort of set of specifications that you get. You go, you figure out some circuit topology that you want to use to meet that set of specs. And then you go and you, know, you do the design. You basically come up with the sizes. You do bias currents, et cetera. And eventually, obviously, that has to go into layout. Okay. So again, sort of in most even design courses, this is kind of the typical flow that you'll learn. And we will indeed cover that, meaning I hand you a set of specs, and you just go and figure out how you build something that meets that set of specifications. But what we'll also do is actually look at where those specs even came from in the first place. Okay? Because again, different than probably most of the sort of undergrad or maybe even grad level analog design courses you've taken in the past, the key point that I'm going to try and be making over and over and over again here is that you shouldn't just sort of take a set of specifications and implement them. Okay? Because Especially in analog, and this is true in design in general, but especially in analog, there are some things that are much easier to do than others. And by easier, I mean lower power or less design time or lower area or any one of another, you know, a number of other metrics. Okay? So at the end of the class, you know, I hope that everyone, and this is despite what other people may tell you, at the end of the class, I hope that everyone will basically, you know, once you're done, you'll go and let's say you're working, or you're doing some research or whatever. If somebody who's, let's say, the system architect goes and hands you a set of specs, you should immediately say, no, I'm not going to implement this. Okay? And you should now, obviously, you'll have to be able to tell them why you're not going to implement that and what it is you are going to implement. Okay? But that's actually what we're going to be learning through this class. And again, really, the, the point here is that sometimes, or really even often, the right thing to do is actually to change the specs you are given in order to make the overall system you're interested in more optimal in some way. Now, the other sort of key point, or really the goal that we need to get to in order to enable you to do that, is to really understand how you create systematic approaches to doing analog design. Okay? And by systematic, I mean based on some set of fundamental principles, where you can write out sort of a design document that says, OK, here are the steps I should take to get from point A to point B. And to tell me what are certain things going to cost. And again, cost could mean area, could mean power, could mean performance, et cetera. Okay? So really the goal is to enable you to come up with or to understand how would you create your own design methodology in a bunch of different applications. Because obviously there's no way that I'm going to be able to cover every single application that you might ever come across. Now, we will show you sort of a specific example of a design methodology that's been worked out you know, sort of over the years. And this is going to be for a relatively low level component. So this will be for an operational transconductance amplifier, specifically being used in the context of some sort of analog to digital converter. Okay? So we'll use that initially to kind of drive a lot of the material that we'll talk about. But keep in mind, again, the point is really for you to understand how you'd come up with your own design methodology. So once we've done this, in order to really drive home the point about, look, there's a larger system that you're always working with, we're actually going to use a slightly more complicated sort of design driver that will really be part of our project in order to understand how would you yourself make some of these trade-offs that I'm going to be talking about throughout the class. Okay. So unless there's sort of any questions on just what the class is all about, and obviously I'll dive some more into that as we go through today, 
Just a few administrative details. First of all, and probably the most important thing, that's the class web page. Uh, pretty easy to find. You know, if you're familiar with any of the previous IC design courses, similar path, just EE240 Spring 10. Okay? So that's going to be sort of, not I shouldn't say your home, but that's going to be your home over the semester because that's where everything's going to be. So all the lecture notes, all the instructions on how to set up the CAD tools, all the homeworks, all the solutions, everything's up on the web. Okay, so definitely take a look there. Uh, as I've noted here, all the announcements I'm going to make are going to be done through that web page. So I won't send out like blanket emails or anything like that. So you know, if you get to a homework and you have a question or just something's not clear, go on the web. Good chance that it'll actually be there. Okay. Uh, the other thing, as I mentioned already, this is going to be a webcasted course. Uh, generally, I think the webcast will sort of be up, let's say, later the same day when the lecture was given. So the link for that is just right here. That's the main Berkeley webcasting system. Just click on EE240. It'll have all the lectures there. That's where you'd find all that. Okay. Now, in terms of just office hours, I'll be holding those essentially immediately after class. So that's Tuesday and Thursday, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. That's just over in my office in Cory. So obviously, you can come and kind of catch me. We can walk together back over to Cory. But that's when all the office hours will be. Uh, just so that you know, slightly different from, for example, 141, which many of you took with me, uh, there's no official GSI for the class. So I'm kind of the guy you come and talk to. Having said that, I did manage to twist one graduate student's arm to kind of help out with the class. Um, I did this last year. It seemed to actually be quite successful. So it looks like we're going to be doing that again this year. So there will be sort of like a discussion session. Uh, the exact time, I don't know yet. Uh, he'll basically sort of cover things about the homework and the material that you know, I thought maybe wasn't as clear to give you guys a hand with. But the thing to keep in mind is this is totally a volunteer position. So if you guys abuse him, he's totally free to just you know, say, forget it, I'm running away, I don't want to talk to these guys ever again. Okay? So just keep that in mind. He's not like you know, a normal GSI where even then you shouldn't abuse them, but even more so, you know, take, it, uh, take it with a grain of salt, I guess. Okay. So in terms of just the class material, pretty much everything that we're going to be talking about is really going to be based on the lecture notes themselves. So this is going to be based on material that uh, Professor Bernhard Boser, Ali Niknajad, and myself basically put together in a set of slides that we've kind of developed over the last several years. So there are going to be some sort of reference text that I'll be pointing to in the list on the next slide. But they're by no means required. And again, the primary source of material really is in these lecture notes. Okay? Now, the other thing that I should note here, and again, for those of you who had me in 141, this will be familiar. I'm going to be scribbling on the slides, uh, hopefully not scribbling, hopefully in a readable way, but I'll be writing on them. And so the only thing is I will not be posting what I write on the web. Okay? So you'll find sometimes actually there's blank slides that unless you come to class or at least watch the class, you, you won't have any idea what's on there. Okay, so the reason for doing that is twofold. One, you know, hopefully the lectures will be somewhat useful, and so that's my way of encouraging you to actually pay attention to them. But two, you know, we've got a reasonable turnout today. But again, given that it's webcast, usually people sort of over the semester trail off. You know, this is another way of me encouraging you to actually show up in class. Okay, so if the you know attendance drops too much, then I may actually cut the webcast or delay it by two weeks or something like that. Because again, the point is that I'm going to try and keep this fairly interactive. And so obviously, if you're not here, I can ask questions to the walls all I want, but that's not going to get us to anywhere too quickly. Okay? Uh, I will, of course, post all the notes on the web just so that you know, they're available to you. I'll also print some number of them to be sort of handed out in class here. Uh, I try and sort of minimize the number of things I print out just so that we don't kill any more trees than we need to. So actually, on that note, who here wants hard copies that I bring to class? And you know, if you do, that's fine. Um, OK, so maybe about half the class or so. OK, uh, that's fine. So I know roughly how many I should bring. So by the way, before we sort of keep going forward, how many of you guys are, let's say, first year graduate students? OK, about what I expected. Uh, beyond first year graduate students? I won't ask how many years. OK, good. How about seniors? Juniors? OK, good. So that's about typical mix for the class. You know, For those of you guys who are undergrads, we've had many undergrads in the class. They do just fine. 
So don't let the grad students intimidate you. They, uh, you know, they're, they're just like you. They want to learn, so don't worry about that. OK, so as I mentioned, these are some of the sort of reference texts that we'll be using in the class. Uh, a lot of these are probably familiar to you if you've taken any analog design class in the past, which if you're here, you really should have. So of course, Gray and Meyer, that's the classic text here from Berkeley. You know, if you're here at Berkeley and you don't own it, then you should feel ashamed of yourself because you know this is like the classic thing you have to have. Okay. Uh, another pretty good text, which I think is being used in 140 now, is Bezad Razavi's text. Um, pretty good sort of intuitive description. Doesn't go into kind of quite as much detail as Gray and Meyer does, but a lot of times for seeing things the first time, it's actually a pretty good book to have handy. Uh, I'll also occasionally refer to this book by Tom Lee. Uh, the focus of that book is technically more on RF, meaning wireless types of things. But actually, he has some pretty good intuitive descriptions of some of the stuff that we'll talk about. And so that's another sort of good one to have handy if, you know, if you're interested. Uh, there's another sort of fairly classic analog design text here, also pretty good reference to have. The last two that I'm sort of highlighting here are slightly more quote unquote peripheral. And what I mean by that is the following. So this first one is written by a guy named Ken Kunder. He was actually a student here at Berkeley and has been out in the industry for a long time, pretty well-known guy. The point of that book is really to get you to know just a little bit something about SPICE and how SPICE works. Now, you may sort of say, well, whatever, SPICE is just SPICE. Why do I care? Well, as I'm sure you've already encountered, and if not, you'll definitely encounter here in this class, sometimes SPICE doesn't work. Okay, sometimes you just you hit the button and it just comes back and gives you some bizarre error message like, I don't know, zero conductance connected to node X12345, right? So why is this book useful? Well, it gives you an idea of what SPICE is doing under the hood so that when it doesn't work, you have an idea of how to fix it. In fact, actually, this is even more important because sometimes SPICE does work but gives you a totally bogus answer, okay? So that's another reason why this type of book is kind of useful, because it gives you an idea of what's the situations to look out for, where, again, SPICE might just give you something totally garbage and not even give you a warning about it. Okay? The other book here is really sort of about modeling MOS transistors, but specifically from the standpoint of an analog designer. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that here in the class, maybe a little bit sort of in the first couple of weeks. But this is kind of a good book to go back and take a look at, especially if some of the stuff doesn't sound familiar or you want a little bit of a refresh on just what do I care about from the standpoint of an MOS transistor if I'm an analog circuit designer. Any kind of questions on any of this stuff so far? Or? OK. So now, of course, the part that many people are interested in. Um, as I say every time in every semester, and you know, again, if you've had me before, then this will be as come as no surprise. You know, if you're here in this class, then it better be because you're here to learn. Okay, so uh, I'll, you know, I'm the first to admit that this class will be a lot of work. So you'll, I'll be keeping you busy. There'll be a nice big design project at the end that you know you'll be frantically putting together the night before. Hopefully not, but that's usually what happens. So again, if you're here, then it better be because you really want to learn. Okay. And so I promise if you do all the work and you stick with the class, you will definitely learn a lot about analog IC design. Now, having said that, of course, unfortunately, I have to grade at some point. Okay? So the way I do the grading is sort of broken down as follows. So there's about 20% on the homework, about 25% on the project, about 20% on the midterm, and 35 on the final. Now, even though, let's say, the homework is, quote, unquote, only worth 20%, um, actually, as again, I'm sure you guys know, if you don't do the homework, you basically have no chance on the rest of the class because it just won't make any sense to you. Okay? So a lot of the learning that really happens happens by actually doing that homework. Now, this is a graduate level class, so it's not going to be the sort of weekly grind. It'll probably be one homework about every two weeks or so. But again, this is really going to be critical in terms of your learning the class material. So don't neglect those because even though it's once every two weeks, There'll be usually fairly substantial amount of work to do to kind of get that all done. And usually by the time I hand it out, you should know most of what you need to know to actually get that homework done. So don't neglect that. Uh, the other piece is we will be making heavy use of SPICE, or really some equivalent simulator. So you'll need to go and figure out how to set that up. Uh, I put some instructions up on the web to help you out with that. 
Uh, you're free to use sort of any simulator you want. So you can use Spectre or Eldo or, I don't know, if you've written your own simulator, you can use that. That's fine with me. The only warning is I'm most familiar with HSplice. So, you know, if, especially if you have, let's say, your own funky simulator, if you run into some problem, I may or may not be able to help you. Okay? So if you stick with HSplice, I'm very familiar with that. I can probably debug just about anything. You know, everything else, up to you. Feel free to do it. Just that's the, uh, the warning that I'll give. As I mentioned, there is also going to be a large project at the end of the semester. Uh, initially, it'll kind of look almost more like a homework, so the things will be a little bit more well-defined. But towards the end, again, I'll open it up to a sort of wider design space, and it'll be up to you to really figure out what's the right direction you want to go in. So the only other thing I'll say about that now, obviously we'll get a lot more into that as the semester goes on, but the only other thing I'll say now is just that this is going to be in groups of two. So find a partner like even today, after class, basically very soon. Okay? Because you know, at the end of the semester, I don't want to be dealing with, oh, I lost my partner, I don't have a partner. You, know, you guys are big, big boys. You guys can figure it out. Big boys and girls, I should say. You can figure it out. Okay? So uh, in terms of the homework, as I'd mentioned, this is going to be sort of a fairly critical piece of things. You can discuss and sort of work together with other people on the homework. But the write-up you actually turn in should be your own write-up. Uh, now, again, I, I sort of hate to have to spend any time on this. But as it should be clear, just don't even think about cheating. It's just going to screw you over in the end, because trust me, you won't know the material. You know, it'll get me mad. There'll be all these university procedures we have to go through. Just don't even think about it. Okay? If you're here for the grade, you're not in the right class. Trust me, there's much, much easier ways to get you know, very high grades. So just don't even think about that. Given that that's the case, again, feel free to chat with everybody. Feel free to talk with each other, reason problems out, because, again, I think that's really the right way to go about doing things, especially given that when you go out in the real world, that's how you're going to be solving problems. But at the end of the day, you have to turn in your own homework. So the way you'll do that is just to basically put it in my inbox outside of my office, which, again, is 519 Corey. Uh, you know, I'll obviously post exactly the due dates, but generally speaking, those will be due at 5 p.m. on Thursdays. Uh, the other thing is that since I'll be posting the solutions fairly shortly after the homeworks are due, basically I won't take any late assignments whatsoever. So you should take 5 p.m. Thursdays. That's like hard deadline. You know, unless you're like really sick or something catastrophic has happened, basically no late homeworks. So just make sure you start early and get that done on time. Okay, so just a couple other sort of scheduling kind of notes. Um, there will be a few sort of breaks and or uh, you know, lectures where we won't necessarily have it that particular day. Uh, the first one is going to be during the week of ISSEC. So this ISSEC, in case you haven't heard of it, is the International Solid State Circuits Conference. That's kind of the premier conference in this field. So you know, if you want to learn some more about analog circuits, digital circuits, RF circuits, any kind of circuits, actually, this is kind of the place to be. So because of that, I won't be giving any lectures during that week because I'll basically be buried at the conference the whole time. But I definitely encourage you guys to go and actually check the conference out. And in fact, if you're a grad student you know, and you're taking this class, go and bug your advisor to you know, cover the, the uh, registration fee because it's just over in San Francisco. So you know, it's not even that hard to get to. Go check it out. You'll actually learn a lot of stuff that's you know, directly related to the material we'll be talking about here. So this is already sort of reflected in the schedule up on the web, but you know, just in case, if you don't see me that particular week, that's why. Okay. The rest of this is sort of somewhat more tentative, but just to give you an idea, the midterm will probably be in sort of mid-March, so roughly March 11th. I probably won't hold lecture that particular day, but the only reason I mention this now here is obviously if you already know now that you can't do that for some reason, let me know. Because obviously, the sooner you tell me, the more likely it is that I'll actually give you an alternate or give you an alternate time to take the exam. But basically, you know, that's roughly where it'll be. So put that on your calendar and plan for that now. Uh, there is, of course, going to be a spring break. And then towards the end of the semester, again, is where we'll be doing the project. Uh, these dates will probably shift around a little bit as we go through. But ballpark, this is what you should plan for. Uh, the last thing, of course, and if you have a conflict with this, then even, even more important than the midterm, you should really tell me, that's when the final is scheduled for. Um, it's a little bit earlier than I would have liked to have had it, but that's about, you know, it's about where it is. And unfortunately, in order to change it, 
You know, I have to walk around and get each one of your guys a signature, which I'm guessing after today is going to be really hard to do because not everyone will be here. So again, if you can't do this, let me know right away because we'll have to take care of that. So any other kind of questions on logistics or anything like that before I kind of dive in a little bit more about what we'll really be talking about? You guys are quiet. Still too early in the morning, huh? OK, I see a few nods. All right, so we'll get some coffee or something to wake you guys up. OK, so now maybe I'll start you know, picking on people, and then we'll, we'll get you guys to wake up that way. So as I said in the beginning, this class is really all about analog ICs. Now, especially a few years ago, there was many people that would say, well, why the heck do we even have this class anymore? Right? I mean, shouldn't everything just be digital? And so why did people say that? Well, again, as I'm sure you guys have heard many, many times by now, there's that famous Moore's Law thing. right? And Moore's Law basically said, OK, if I scale technologies, then what it costs me to implement some function should basically go down by something like 30% each year. So just to put that into a different terms, that means it's a factor of 30 every 10 years. Or more specifically, for those of you guys who are PhD students, it's about a factor of five during the time that you're here as a PhD. Okay? So if you're doing something that you know, isn't going to save you like a factor of five, forget it. Just you know, wait for five years and then wrote, OK, I scaled everything. You know, turn that into your advisor and, and get out of here. Okay? So why is this important? Well, what it basically means is that if I'm going to build something, if I can do it in digital, then Really quickly, it becomes very cheap to do that. On the other hand, in analog, that scaling is not quite as clear. Okay? So it's not as clear that the cost per function really does move along with the technology generation. And we'll get into sort of the details of why that is, but there's some really common complaints that people have about basically scaling analog into new technologies and why that's really nasty and doesn't actually buy you anything. This is an example. People say, oh, the supply voltage is too low. I have horrible devices. They have no gain at all. Like if I get a gain of one, I'm happy. They, are, they match horribly. Like I can't rely on anything anymore. All this long list of complaints about why it really, really sucks to have to bring analog into some state-of-the-art technology. Let's say, I don't know, 45 nanometers or something like that. OK? And so you know, as we'll see through the class, some of these things maybe are, are correct. Some of them maybe are not so correct. But basically, based on that, just you know, it was a very common belief to say, look, analog is just going to die. Everything will be digital because digital eventually will just scale and it'll be so much cheaper. So we'll just go with digital. So now, who agrees with that statement? Who thinks everything, the world is going to be digital, let's say, 10 years from now? OK, well, I guess you're in the class, so maybe that's a foregone conclusion. But now, here's the real question. So why not? Why are you guys interested in analog? I'll start throwing stuff at people you know, to get you to wake up. So why not? Why, why, do, why do you guys think analog is still going to be interesting? Why are you here in this class? Other than you have to take the prelim. <laughs> OK, RF transmitter and receivers. You know, uh, I'm going to try and push down a little bit more on that. So yes, that's, you know, what, what's special about RF transmitters and receivers? Everything in the world is analog. So. Ah, OK. So you maybe skipped a, high, a few slides. Yes, everything in the world is analog. but. We'll maybe talk a little bit more. What does that really mean? Why is that important? Sensors or whatnot. OK. So interfaces with the real world, generally that's, you know, as we said, the real world is analog. And so somehow you've got to figure out how to talk with the real world. So that's, those are all actually very good things. And as I said, we'll push into that a little bit more in a second. But actually, I would even claim that even if you believed that everything was going to be digital, you still need analog designers. Okay. And so why do I say that? Well, I actually claim that if you want to be a good digital designer, you actually have to understand analog. Okay? And so here's the way I make that claim. Well, in digital, sure, I can kind of push a button. I can write some VHDL and push a button and synthesize you know, some sort of fairly large circuit in the so-called ASIC flow. And I can get that to run at, let's say, medium frequencies, where medium maybe means like, I don't know, about a gigahertz or so these days. But remember, somebody actually had to build the standard cells that you used in order to create that ASIC. 
right? So I kind of claim you need to know a little bit something about transistors to do that. Now, by the way, if you actually look at any big digital circuit, a lot of that is actually going to turn out to be memories. And so, in fact, you know, if, if you say, OK, fine, maybe this is just a good digital IC designer. Actually, if you look inside of memories, you really need to even know like, a lot of analog stuff to actually get memories to actually work correctly. Now, it's, it's actually even stronger than that. Because if you really start pushing the limits on what you can do in digital, a lot of the issues turn out to really be analog. Okay? So just as an example, if you use some more aggressive circuit styles, there'll be things like charge sharing you'll run into. There'll be things like interconnect parasitics that will come into the picture, things like coupling. All these things that, you know, even though we're dealing with digital, actually are basically analog issues that you need to know about. Okay? The other thing which is actually sort of a bigger and bigger deal these days is, as I mentioned before, no two transistors really match each other all that well, particularly in these more advanced processes that people are working with these days. And so again, even if you're doing digital stuff, particularly in things like memories, actually you have to worry a lot about just how the analog characteristics are changing, because if it changes too much, you might not actually get back something that's really digital the way you wanted it to be. Okay? So, you know, first of all is just, okay, let's concede or let's argue that maybe the world goes digital. Even if it is, you still need to know analog stuff. Now, as you guys already actually maybe hinted at, interfaces always turn out to be a little bit tricky, right? Because the world is analog. So actually, it turns out, even if you look at interfaces between two digital chips, and I really mean two purely digital chips, even there, actually, analog turns out to play a pretty critical role. So what I'm showing here is just a picture of, again, these are two totally di digital chips. And we'll see if somebody recognizes where they're from in a second. That basically are just, see, so if you can kind of see all these little traces here on the PCB, that's just a bunch of wires connecting those two chips together. So that's basically just the high-speed interface between them. So it's just sending bits from point A to point B. Okay. So obviously, the purpose here, at least on, let's say, the receive side of one of these things, is to figure out. Were the bits that were transmitted on the other side, were they 1 or 0? Okay. And so again, as it's going to turn out, and we're going to see this later on in the class, because this is going to be our driving example. If these are sort of the shape of the bits that I sent at the transmit side, by the way, this is called an I diagram. Literally, all I did was just took all the bits that were transmitted and folded them on top of each other in time. Okay. So if you had something that was really perfect, you'd just see sort of things that look kind of square like this. And obviously, once you round it off a little bit, that's why it looks a little bit more like an I. Okay, but basically, you've got you know nice, clean ones and zeros. The time when you get a one and zero is also pretty well defined. So if that's what I transmitted, well, unfortunately, by the time it gets across that PCB, it looks more like what I drew on the right over there. Okay, so again, the point is now, well, I have a little bit of separation between the one and the zero, but it's not as clear anymore. Right? In fact, even the time at which it's a good digital 1 or 0 is also not all that clear anymore. Okay? In other words, I used to have this nice, clean digital waveform. Now it looks a lot more analog. Okay? And again, as we'll see later on in the class, I can actually take this really ugly thing, and if I pass it through some fairly simple analog circuits, I can actually get a very nice, clean digital bit back. So even if I'm talking about purely digital interfaces, analog actually comes quite a bit into the picture. Now, by the way, anybody have any idea what this, you know, what, what, what PCB I happen to take this particular snapshot from? Anybody recognize anything here? Yeah, it's the PlayStation 3. All right, so again, the, the sort of peak of digital stuff that you might be doing, you know, this is your digital, uh, digital gaming machine on your digital TV, right? Actually, you've got quite a bit of analog buried inside of there. Okay, so we'll come back to that particular example just because you know, I happen to work on that one, so I know a lot of stuff about it. So you know, I can tell you more about that later, but that's why I happen to pick that particular example. But again, you know, just about any other PCB you take, even like your laptop or whatever, similar type of stuff going on. Okay, so now, as people already pointed out to, you know, I was kind of leading you in this direction of interfaces. Well, again, the real world is analog, right? And so if I want to interface to just about anything, I basically need some sort of analog circuitry, or at least some understanding about what the analog behavior really is going to be. Okay? 
Now, by the way, just as kind of a reminder, don't forget that digital signals, of course, also have analog characteristics. In fact, the only reason we even invented digital in the first place was because there was certain analog characteristics that we kind of didn't want to have to deal with. We kind of wanted to just somehow ignore those or lump them into something. So just as maybe, again, a review, what was the key thing that, that made us want to use digital circuits? Cost. Well, uh, th that's true, but I mean, in terms of like, why did people invent digital circuits in the first place? Oh, really, exactly. how do you even define a digital circuit? What's like the key thing that you're trying to avoid or make sure effectively has no impact on you? Noise, was it? Yeah, noise, right? The key with digital is it's a way of building things that look like they have no noise in the system. Okay? So, again, if you look inside of most real chips, let's say that's what you thought your digital signal was. In reality, it usually does something like that. Okay? It's got all kinds of analog junk on it. It's just that as long as we build things that can reject that noise, we can kind of ignore the fact that a lot of that is happening. Okay? Now, by the way, again, even if you're doing mostly digital stuff, in many applications you'll work on, actually building the analog turns out to be sort of in the critical design path. So again, as if you look at, let's say, a microprocessor or something like that, there's probably about a billion transistors on that thing. Probably about, I don't know, let's say 990 million of those are digital. And about 10 million of them are analog. But those 10 million analog transistors took just as much time, if not even more, to design as the 990 million digital ones did. Okay? Because, again, it's analog. You have to worry a lot more about the details. So just as a few examples, in case you don't believe me, we already looked at this. You know, Just these things that basically talk from one chip to another, a lot of analog stuff inside of there. So that's anywhere from Ethernet to memory IOs. In fact, if you look at, let's say, you know, big server systems with the optical interconnects, all that stuff has a lot of analog functionality inside of it. As Brian already mentioned, another really you know, very common example of that is RF transceivers meaning radios, obviously both on the transmit and on the receive side. We'll look at a couple of examples of that. And in fact, even sort of just in so-called sensors, this is maybe the most obvious one, a lot of basically analog processing that happens inside of there. And you know, just to stick with sort of the gaming example, you know, the Wii and kind of all the cool stuff about the Wii, that's really just enabled by analog. Because there's this MEMS accelerometer inside of there, and that's really what's kind of driving all the coolness of that interface. So let's just maybe take a look at a few kind of examples for things. And in the process of doing that, you know, maybe we'll sort of drive at why things are done sort of the way that they are. Okay? So let's look at an RF receiver in this particular example here. So what I've shown here is just kind of a block diagram of what a typical RF receiver looks like. Okay? And so you can see there's lots of stuff happening inside of here. So some sort of no, low noise amplifier another low noise amplifier, some sort of filter, these mixers, basically you know, a bunch of these various different blocks. right? So here's maybe just one kind of interesting question to, again, drive at why you might need to do analog stuff. So OK, maybe the antenna, we said the real world is analog, so somehow I need to interface you know, with the electromagnetic waves. So fine, I need an antenna right? just to kind of grab energy out of the, the world. But OK, why don't I just take that antenna and immediately afterwards put an ADC and then just process everything in the digital domain? Why don't I do that? Why, you know, what's, what's bad about that? Any thoughts? You, you need a lot of sensitivity, a high sampling, and if you can meet those, then it would consume a lot of power. Ah, OK, wow. You, you, you got the slam dunk answer because you hit everything. And I was going to get like three people to answer it, but that's fine. <laughs> so you said you need sensitivity. You need high sample rate. And if I combine those two together, it's going to be power. OK, so that's absolutely correct. So maybe you know, just to pick on other people, let's put some numbers into this. So sensitivity, what, what does that translate into from the standpoint of an ADC? What's like the number that you would quote in terms of an ADC that would tell you the sensitivity? Yeah, the number of bits. So anybody have any idea? How many bits would you need if you tried to do something like this? 16. 16. Okay, that's not a bad. That's about right. 
Yeah, depends on exactly what you're doing, but somewhere between about, let's say, 12 to 15 or 16 bits. I, I agree with that. How fast do you need to sample? Like this. Oh, okay. No, yeah. So you're you're again just you know we'll have to get somebody else to answer. So yes, Nyquist. But what might Nyquist be? Let's say I wanted to you know build the radio that could cover every single frequency band that people are interested in these days. About what would that be? Any thoughts? Ten gigahertz. Yeah, about ten gigahertz, right? In fact, there's probably about ten gigahertz of spectrum that people are using. So I probably need about ten to twenty giga samples per second. OK, so now here comes the fun question. How much power do you guys think an ADC like that would actually take? Any thoughts? And not will. Hundreds of milliwatts? Hundreds of milliwatts. Oh, if you could do that, you'd be really good. <laughs> so if you can do that, you know, if you know how to do that, come talk. Because, you know, I want to start the company. So. <laughs> Any other ideas? Watts. Watts, OK, I'm starting to agree with that. How many, you know, are we talking like 1, 2, 5, 10? Any ideas? Just take a guess. Tens? Tens. Uh, yeah, probably tens or 10 is about right. So just to give you an idea, you know, well, maybe you can't do this so easily. If you took one of the, let's say, latest and greatest Agilent oscilloscopes, or actually even Tektronix or one of these other companies, and you opened it up, inside of that box is a about 8-bit 20 giga sample per second A to D converter. Okay? These days, those things take about 10 watts. So by the way, notice this was 12 to 15 bits, because we'll talk a little bit more later. Adding one more bit, unfortunately, is not just a factor of two, but a factor of four in power. So you can calculate pretty quickly how, sort of, how much power you'd have to take if you really wanted to do what I said here. Now, that design that I talked about was you know, relatively old, so there's maybe some scaling factors you can apply there. But bottom line, it's going to take you something like 10 watts or so. So I don't know about you guys, but I don't want something dissipating 10 watts next to my head. All right, that's just too hot. No, no good for me, at least. You know, maybe on a cold day like this, it's a good heater. But other than that, uh, I, I certainly don't want it. Okay? So that's really the problem. It's really that if you wanted to try and do that, it would cost you a lot of power. And so it turns out that if you actually do all this kind of complicated stuff that I've drawn here, you can actually do it in way, way less power consumption. Okay? So just still sort of sticking with the RF side, you know, hopefully I've convinced you why you actually want to build some RF stuff. The other thing that's sort of, or really the other sort of two things that are interesting to look at is, roughly speaking, there's about a 50-50 split between stuff that's quote unquote RF meaning operating up at some carrier frequency, versus the stuff that we usually refer to as quote unquote analog, meaning it's down at baseband and you know, has some bandwidth around that. The other thing that's kind of interesting to look at here is, this is a die photo of a wireless LAN transceiver. And by the way, this was back in 0.18 micron technology, meaning relatively old technology. Even here, if you look at it, actually a large chunk of the die is just taken up by RF and analog stuff. Okay? So again, if you didn't believe me before that you know, RF and analog from a cost standpoint is actually oftentimes fairly critical, just take a look at this picture. Because A, you know, again, this isn't a pretty old technology. So if I move this to, let's say, 45 nanometers, all this digital stuff around it, I shouldn't say disappear, but you know, would look way, way smaller. right? Whereas a lot of this stuff over here, not so clear that it would actually change in size at all. Okay? So again, that's why kind of doing analog design turns out to be fairly critical. Now, by the way, just because this is sort of an issue that you, again, probably have heard about many times, I kind of notice how there's this you know, analog and RF stuff over on the corner. And then there seems to be some space around it. Why is that? Why, why might you do something like that? Why would you leave blank space on you know, the silicon die? Which, by the way, is, you know, from a real estate standpoint, silicon acreage is like the most expensive thing on the planet by many orders of magnitude. So why would you leave blank space? Any thoughts? The digital switching may couple to the analog part. Yeah, basically, you're worried about there's some digital, uh, you know, I'll be mean since I'm also a digital guy, there's some digital junk happening there. right? That digital junk can create noise. 
or really interference that couples into the analog stuff. So again, as we'll maybe talk about a little bit more later on, one of the sort of simplest ways to just avoid that is to just leave space between them. Okay. So again, a lot of these sort of analog types of issues, even if you're sitting just next to some digital thing, actually turns out to be a pretty, cr pretty critical thing that you really have to worry about. So this is just another sort of typical example of where analog really comes into the picture. This is a MEMS accelerometer that Professor Boser had done actually about, I guess that's almost 15 years ago now. So again, this is actually something very similar to what you might find inside of your Wii. So the idea here is that basically, essentially based on some motion of a suspended structure, you're going to try and figure out how quickly is your chip actually accelerating. Now, what's fairly impressive is if you look at some of these sort of types of designs, the level of sophistication that people get to in terms of how good you do of a job from the analog standpoint is a lot of times these things are measuring displacements down in the sort of subatomic range. Okay, so to get the kind of resolution that you can do today, that's kind of the equivalent displacement you'd really be measuring. Okay? So again, the point here is that you know you can try and do that kind of in a straightforward digital thing, but Trust me, if you don't understand the analog, basically ain't going to happen. Okay. So, again, just to sort of wrap this up a little bit from the discussion about you know digital versus analog and why we're even here in this class. In digital, really, again, the key the key thing was that I could basically abstract things as being ones and zeros. And again, the reason I did that was so that I can essentially say that for stuff that varies around the actual analog level. I'm just going to ignore that, right? And so that lets me say that I have a noise margin. It lets me build things up and pretend that there was no noise in the system. Now, what's great about that is that that lets me really abstract my design. It really lets me sort of ignore a lot of the details as to what's happening. And so because of that, I can basically say, OK, my abstraction is, let's say, either gates or registers. And so I can write some sort of hardware description language. And then based on that harder description language, I can come up with all kinds of rules and techniques to essentially automatically generate my entire design based on that description. Okay? If you contrast that to analog, well, in analog, oftentimes the lowest level sort of abstraction, or really the highest level abstraction we can do is the device. Okay? And unfortunately, it's usually like you know, the device model that's our abstraction. So by the way, how many of you guys have actually opened up a BSIM model and taken a look at it? Anybody ever done that? OK, so I'm guessing at least a few of you have just opened like you know, the list of parameters, right? And if you did that, you saw there was probably about two, 300 of those parameters. Well, by the way, the model is several thousand lines of code, OK? So this doesn't sound like very good news from the standpoint of doing design, right? Because I don't know about you, but I can't, you know, I can't think several thousand lines of code in my head. Right? I, I can't use that as a very simple abstraction. Right? So that's really one of the reasons why analog is just so much harder to actually do from a design standpoint. And to kind of phrase this another way, if I want to build analog stuff, obviously I'm going to have to do better than BSIM. I'm going to have to do some sort of abstraction. But the trick you run into is that the abstraction you end up using really depends on the context of what you're interested in. Okay? Because it may be that you're working, let's say, with op amps, and what you're doing makes a lot of sense for op amps, and so that's your abstraction. Maybe what you really want is a filter, so that's your abstraction, or maybe what you really want is a comparator, and so that's your abstraction. In fact, actually, each one of these three things that I just talked about, I could actually implement in almost exactly the same way. And it's just based on the context of how I'm using it that really changes what this, how I think about this particular block. Okay? The other thing, of course, is just from a design standpoint, analog layout usually is very meticulously handcrafted. And we'll actually talk some more about some of these sort of tricks and rules that you need to follow to do that. But very, very rarely is this ever actually generated kind of by you pushing a button. It's usually you sitting there and like, you move that little piece of poly, and you move the little diffusion, and you try and really craft it down to that last little detail. Okay. So just in terms of what we're going to be really focusing on here in the class, our focus, again, is going to be really on analog rather than quote, unquote, RF. And 
so just to sort of not necessarily be mean, but just to sort of quantify what I mean by that, in this class, what I mean by RF is essentially analog with inductors. Okay? So all that means is that in RF, basically, you're usually dealing with things that look relatively sinusoidal, meaning they're relatively narrow band. They may be at a pretty high frequency, but the bandwidth around that frequency generally isn't that large. Okay? So because of that, you tend to use these so-called tuned circuit techniques. And by tuned circuits, that usually means some sort of LC resonant type of behavior. And so that's what I mean by analog with inductors. The other sort of big difference with analog versus RF is that in RF, the impedance you can actually use, meaning the impedance levels you use, unfortunately are often relatively constrained and are fairly low. Okay, So I, I kind of mentioned here that I can't make the antenna impedance too high. Anybody have an idea why it is that you know, in RF you usually end up with these fairly low impedances? What's kind of going on there? Why is that important? The current signal? The current signal. Um, not exactly. So actually, well, let's, let's maybe come back to that. So maybe I'll ask a slightly different question. So who knows what the impedance of an electromagnetic wave is? 376. Yeah, 376 ohms, right? So remember, all an antenna is doing is transforming from the impedance of free space to whatever it is that is inside of your system, OK? So now, why might you want that to be relatively low impedance? What does low impedance kind of mean from a really kind of fundamental standpoint? What's bad about things with high impedance? Hard to drive. Hard to drive. Uh, you've almost got it. I just want the re you know the reverse of what you said. You've you've almost got it. Low gain. Low gain. When you say gain, what's the you know gain in terms of what? Oh. Power. Ah, there we go. So the problem is if I have things that have high impedance, it's hard to suck power out of them. Okay. And remember, if I've got an electromagnetic wave, I want to suck power out of that thing, or at least absorb it into my receiver, so that I can actually get the signal out. Okay, So the trick with RF is you usually end up with these pretty low impedances because you're really limited by the power of the signal itself. Okay, In analog, or so-called analog mixed signal, I have a lot more design freedom. So as an example, if I want to get voltage gain, I want to have really high impedance. right? Because you know, if I have some transconductance and I drive a really high impedance, then I'll get a lot of voltage gain. Similarly, if I want to get current gain, then I'd have a relatively low impedance because I want to suck all that current out, right? So really, again, the key difference here is that in analog, we're dealing generally with either voltage or current gain, but not power gain. Whereas RF, the reverse is generally true, OK? The other sort of big difference is that in analog and mixed signal, oftentimes I don't deal with continuous signals, but rather with sampled signals or discrete time signals. Again, that's going to sort of translate into differences in the way we even just think about how our circuits are actually operating. Now, the other thing that's sort of interesting is that if you sort of look at some of the trends as to what RF has been doing, there's actually been somewhat of a shift towards more quote unquote analog design techniques. So if you looked at, let's say, a sort of classic RF receiver, you can see there's lots of these inductors here, lots of tuning that you know, sort of gets it down into one particular frequency band. Well, again, if you remember actually from this die photo over here, you can actually almost even see them. All these inductors are pretty darn big, OK? Because whether we like it or not, Maxwell's equations just, you know, they're not changing, right? They're not scaling along with our transistors. So if I need a certain size inductor, certain physical size that I actually have to cover to do that, OK? So as we're scaling, actually, and, you know, I've written what the technical details of, of that means, we're moving more towards these so-called analog types of techniques, where I maybe have this fairly broadband amplifier. So now, again, uh, you know, I said I maybe wanted to do this because then I could get rid of a bunch of inductors. It's smaller. It's then easier to scale. So what's the penalty I paid? Why didn't people do this from the get-go? What's quote unquote bad about that? Any thoughts? Power. 
Um, okay, I can cast it that way, but let's be like you know really more specific. Just not fast enough in the old technology. Okay, that's maybe fair. Um, I can translate it into a slightly <laughs> different way, but you're kind of saying, well, in an old technology, I just couldn't build something that would operate that quickly. That's kind <coughs> of true, but there's actually an, uh, a more, I shouldn't say direct, but there's another consequence of that. So let's say I really did have something that's operating from, I don't know, 0 to 10 gigahertz, just like this, versus this thing where I use inductors, and I'm just picking off a signal exactly at 5 gigahertz. Noise. Yeah, there we go. It's noise. Okay, so the real reason why people did this was because even if you could get the thing to operate from there, as we'll see a little bit later on, if you make a circuit operate over a wide bandwidth, it's actually going to pick up more noise. Okay, so it's going to turn out the amount of noise that you'd be picking up is actually related to the device speed in some way, and so that's why this becomes more attractive as the devices are getting sort of faster, because we're definitely going to pay a noise penalty, but Maybe not such a huge thing, so that we can actually reap some of the benefits of getting rid of these inductors. Okay. Now, so again, what we're really going to be focusing on is mostly these sort of mixed signal types of designs. And as I hinted at a little bit earlier, in mixed signal designs, actually, you know, the a lot of times it's really sort of difficult to figure out what the abstraction should actually be. And in fact, in many cases it won't even be clear where is the line between what's digital and what's analog. Okay? And this happens very, very often in things that sort of straddle the interface between the two. All right, so analog to digital converters, that's kind of the classic example. But I've shown another example here, which is a so-called phase lock loop. So phase lock loop, just in case you haven't heard of it, all it does is it takes in some input clock frequency and generates another clock frequency, perhaps at a different higher frequency, but that just is locked as being some multiple of that input clock. Okay? And so you know, if you don't know the details of what's going on in this block diagram, don't worry too much about that. The key point here is really, again, sometimes it's not even clear what's analog and what's digital. Because as an example here, what I'm showing is that maybe the way I generate that new frequency is by changing the supply voltage of some ring oscillator. Right? If I ramp the supply voltage, the thing goes faster. Right? So now here's the quote unquote million dollar question. Is this circuit here analog or digital? What do you guys think? Who thinks that it's a digital circuit? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's an analog circuit? And there's maybe like 30% of the class that I have to throw something at to get an answer. So or maybe, you know, maybe there's a third option. Who thinks it's both? OK, well, so in some sense, I claim you're all right. So you know, if I look at it inside of it, it's kind of a digital circuit, right? It's just a pile of inverters, and you know, I can do all the standard digital calculations I do. Well, but I'm driving it from a port that has an analog characteristic, right? So from that standpoint, it's analog. Well, again, I don't know how to treat it unless I really think about what it is, the characteristic that I'm interested in. Okay? Once I know that, then I can decide, OK, should I treat this thing as being digital? Should I treat it as analog? Bottom line, I really have to understand what it is that I'm trying to implement. So the last thing that I want to just briefly touch on, and we'll actually see this more as we go through the class, um, it used to be that sort of you know, in analog design classes, you really talked all about just analog and amplifiers and things like that. Well, these days, you, you can't really do that. Okay? You really got to think about, again, what's the overall system you're going to be in? And actually, what's the digital stuff that you're going to be talking to? Because even if you're doing a quote unquote very traditional analog thing, there's probably going to be a lot of digital stuff wrapped around it. And the reason for that should be sort of fairly obvious, right? We said before, digital from a cost standpoint scales very, very nicely. So if I can figure out some way of building some digital stuff that makes my analog better, then actually, oftentimes, that's really the right thing to do. And actually, in RF, this is one of the most obvious things, because as I'd mentioned before, inductors are pretty big. So if you actually look at it in 90 nanometer, one RF inductor, which is about, let's say, 200 microns by 200 microns, takes the same area as an entire microprocessor. Okay, now, this is maybe not the latest and greatest microprocessor, but this is maybe equivalent of, I don't know, a 286 or 386 or maybe even a 486. Okay, so fairly sophisticated thing, meaning a few million or at least a couple million transistors. right? 
I can do a lot of stuff with a couple million transistors. Right? I can figure a lot of things out. So again, the point here is that when you can, it really does make sense to leverage some sort of digital processing to make your life easier in the analog domain. Okay? And again, we'll talk some more about what are the kinds of problems that you can solve very easily in digital versus in analog. Now, again, this is not to say that analog design goes away, or I should say good analog design, because again, if you really want to figure out what's the right, you know, where you really draw this green versus white lines, or black lines, I should say, you got to understand what, what, you know, what style of implementation makes the most sense in what context, and what really the whole system drives you to end up wanting to do. Okay? So that's really just sort of a quick overview of just why it is that we're even here in the class. In terms of the details, we'll start out with next lecture talking about kind of the devices themselves, really just to set up the things that we're going to be interested in. So we'll look at both passive devices and the active devices. And in fact, we'll probably spend more time on passive, because in analog, that oftentimes is even more critical than the active devices themselves. And again, it's not that we're going to spend a lot of time on modeling, but we're really going to look at this in the context of analog designers and how we want to use those components. The next topic that we'll spend a lot of time on that you may not have seen in the past is electronic noise, because that's actually going to turn out to really set the power consumption of many of the blocks we're going to end up building. Once we've sort of understood that, then we're going to come back and kind of review some of the basic support functions that you've probably seen before. But now that we understand more about noise and some of these passives, we're going to sort of take a closer look at how you'd really want to do those kinds of things. So things like current sources, referencing, references, biasing, we'll take a look at that. Once we've got that in place, then we'll really start our sort of journey on looking at design methodologies. Okay, and again, the first sort of thing that we'll look at is the so-called you know, most basic analog gate or an amplifier. Okay, so we'll look at basically what type of methodology would you use to design that, what are the contexts in which you'd use that, how would you use it in, let's say, feedback, how does that usually translate into things when you look at discrete time response? Things of that nature. Once we've done that towards the end of the class, again, to really give you a chance to exercise the material that you've learned and understand how to come up with a design methodology and a new application, we'll spend some time looking at basically high-speed links, meaning interfaces between two digital chips. So again, that'll motivate sort of some additional building blocks as well as, well as why we care about certain specs. But it's just going to give us a sort of driving example to really exercise a lot of the material that we've been talking about. And then if we have time, we'll talk about some other sort of components that usually end up being critical in many of these analog mixed signal domains. But we'll sort of see how things go and where we get to from that standpoint. So just in case you're sort of curious, uh, 247 isn't offered this semester. But if you have taken 247, just to give you an idea of what the differences between 240 and 247 are, here, we're really working at the transistor level. Okay, so we're really looking at transistor level building blocks. And we're going to be looking at sort of the device and circuit uh, fundamentals. So a lot of the class is going to be kind of at a very low level of abstraction, meaning spice. Whereas if you've taken 247, most of that actually deals with kind of macro models or sort of higher level behaviors of larger systems. So there, you also talk a little about some sort of the signal processing fundamentals, but a lot of the evaluation you do ends up being in MATLAB rather than really building spice level models or really spice level designs of things up. As I mentioned before, in 240, you know, we're not going to be dealing with sort of narrow band RF kinds of things. That's more the domain of 142 and 242. And again, the real difference is that you know, for us, we're almost never going to talk about inductors. Whereas in 142, 242, inductors are basically ubiquitous. The other big difference is that for us, because we're going to be dealing mostly with so-called wideband or broadband signals, actually feedback is going to be a lot more common than where it was up in the sort of 142, 242 realms of things. Okay? So again, that's the sort of key differences there, where again, in 240, the signals we're dealing with are in some sense arbitrary. So I don't know ahead of time that it kind of looks sinusoidal. It could just be just about anything. Okay? Oh, and the other thing I should mention is, unlike in 142, 242, what you're going to spend most of your time worrying about in terms of parasitics is capacitors. Okay, that's generally what's going to be sort of setting 
all of your design equations and things that you care about. The last one that I'll just briefly mention is 240 versus 231. 231 is the devices course. It really concentrates on device physics. We're going to try and ignore device physics to the maximum extent that we can. Okay, now, obviously, that should strike you as, well, how the heck are you going to do that? Trust me, I'm going to show you some very nice methodologies that, obviously, you need to know about those things, but will largely let you push a lot of the device physics to be outside of the design loop. So in some sense, you're just going to sort of figure out there's some lookup table that you're going to use that's going to tell you all of the horrible, nasty, nonlinear stuff the device is doing. But from the standpoint of your design, you'll know really what the right answer should be. Okay. So any sort of questions or comments or anything like that on the material? Or? Again, quiet bunch. Uh, absolutely. So just in case people didn't hear, the question was, is there verification challenges with doing things like these so-called digitally assisted analogs? Absolutely. Now, it turns out that actually verifying analog in general has problems, right? Because you basically put this large system together, you simulate the analog in SPICE, and you have a pile of hardware description language for your digital. And obviously, those two things don't directly talk to each other very nicely. So there's lots of stuff that people come up with where you know, the, you maybe will do so-called a co-simulation. We will take the outputs from, let's say, Verilog or VHDL and try and drive that into the analog. But once you get a fairly large system and you have to run things for a really long time to see how things behave, even that doesn't work out so nicely. So in fact, these days what a lot of people will do is you'll write models in Verilog of analog stuff. Okay, so you'll actually literally you know, write differential equations and things like that of your analog things just to be able to verify that the overall system you're interested in really will work. So that's a great question. And if you're interested, you know, come back and bug me some more. Um, that's not something we'll probably spend too much time on here in this class. But you know, if you really want to go out and build some real chips, that's a very critical thing that, that you, know, you should definitely worry about. And sometime in the future, I'll probably even teach a class kind of talking about some of that stuff. So that's a, that's a great question. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, is it a concern if we haven't taken 141? Uh, no, so 141 is not required. Um, so we won't be really like building any digital circuits. Uh, I will occasionally refer to things that actually turn out to be very similar to things you might have seen in 141. But you know the material will be self-contained. So you know if there's something you're not sure about, and I just say, oh, remember for 141, you know, feel free to raise your hand or just come bug me. You know, we'll review that. Any other questions? Okay, great. So we'll end early for today, and I'll see you guys on Thursday.